Hi guys, let's continue further about the nervous system. Today we will discuss about the various aspects of heart. So let's continue further about the nervous system. Today let us discuss something about the reflex action and the types of reflex action. So we have some activities that are taking place involuntarily. We are showing a response to a peripheral stimulation that is that occurs involuntarily. And also, it requires the involvement of a part of the central nervous system. Then it is called what is known as a reflex action. Any involuntary response. Any involuntary response which requires a part of the central nervous system. The response is actually taking place because of the peripheral stimulation. That is when the nerves are stimulated, when the peripheral nerves are stimulated because of certain just actually stimuli from the external environment leading to what is called some sort of involved responses to that stimulation and that is what is called as the reflex action. So what is given here also the definition. The entire process of uh, what is called peripheral, the entire process of response, when we are showing a response, the entire response to peripheral nerve stimulation, which occurs involuntarily and which requires the involvement of the part of the central nervous system, not the entire central nervous system, a part of the central nervous system is taking part in producing such responses, is called what is known as reflex action. A response to peripheral nerve stimulation, the one which occurs involuntarily, without consciousness, without actually just actually the effort of thought, and also which requires a part of the central nervous system is called as the reflex action. For example, on at the site of food, watering of the mouth occurs, what is called the salivation occurs, or the blinking of the eyes, the blinking of the eyes, the eyelids being actually closed, when some objects are approaching suddenly to the eye. So these are all some of the examples for somatic reflex reactions, somatic reflex reactions. So these are all commonly called as somatic reflex reactions because the muscles are involved. So watering of the mouth at the site of food and also the closure of the eyelids are just due to the sudden appearance of an object just before the eyelid. These are all examples for reflex action that do the somatic reflex actions. So the one which occurs involuntarily without what is called your consciousness. And now what do you mean by reflex arc? So the anatomical basis of reflex action is called reflex arc. The various components which are involved in reflex action together constitute what is called the reflex arc. It is nothing but a nerve chain between the receptor organ or the sensory organ and the effector organ, namely the muscles or the glands, anything else. So anyway, a nerve chain is formed between the receptor, the one who receives the stimulus from the environment, either from the external environment or from the internal environment and also the one which is responding to the stimulus, namely the effector organ. So, the nerve chain between these two constitutes what is called the reflex arc. That is why here it is given the anatomical basis of reflex action. There is a various components of the reflex action together constitute what is called the reflex arc. Now, what are the components? Altogether, we have five components are present in what is called the reflex arc. The anatomical basis of reflex action or the nerve chain between just we have between the receptor and what is called the effector. So possibly we have the receptor in the skin, the one which is responding to various types of stimuli. For example, the petalar stimulus or touching hot object and also just actually some objects are approaching or pricking of uh, the legs or we have the limbs with a needle. So all are examples for what is called the stimulation. So for example, when you are touching a hot object, that stimulus stimulates the receptors in the skin, that is a receptor organ. That is number one, the unit of reflex arc. Now the message that is received by the receptor organ or the sensory organ is conveyed to what is called that is simply the spinal cord through a sensory neuron or afferent neuron. This is common number two sensory neuron or just actually afferent neuron which enters into the gray matter through the dorsal root of the spinal. Now, then just we have the third component what we have the gray matter, the gray matter of the spinal cord. 
Now for just making a junction between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron, we have a neuron what is called as an interneuron or association neuron or relay neuron, the one which is formed. That is in the grey matter which forms a synapse with the cell body of the motor neuron and also that is actually the dendron of the sensory neuron because the cytome of the sensory neuron are formed simply what we have in the dorsal root ganglion. The cytone of the sensory neuron are formed in the dorsal root ganglion whereas the cytone or the cell body of the motor neuron is formed in the grey matter. So the interneuron or association neuron or relay neuron forms a synapse with the dendron of the sensory neuron and the cell body or the cytone of the motor neuron. Now this is common number 3 and this is interneuron is the common number 4. And now the motor information is carried away from the spinal cord by means of what is called the efferent neuron or the motor neuron. Efferent neuron or motor neuron. So we have a receptor in the skin, then afferent neuron, then we have the grey matter, then interneuron or relay neuron or association neuron. And then we have the efferent neuron or the motor neuron which carries a message to the effector organ, the one which does the action which is normally in the form of muscle or in the form of glands. So we have that is the various components of the reflex organ, receptor or sensory organ. Then the message is conveyed to the spinal cord by means of afferent or sensory neuron. Then we have that is a grey matter of the spinal cord where there is a synapse formation with B what is called that is the interneuron and the dendron of the sensory neuron and the cytone of the motor neuron. The motor neuron carries away the information from the spinal cord to the effector organ, the one which does the action here, it is given nothing but the mass. So these are all the various components which are involved, that is what is called reflex or that is anatomical basis. The anatomical basis of the reflex action is called the reflex or the same one is given the same manner but a different diagram and go through the diagram you can, you can understand the same also. Now just knee jerk or patellar reflex. How can you prove that just a reflex action is taking place? We have the components what we have the anatomical basis of reflex action the components starting from the receptor organ ending with the effector organ. Now for example when the knee cap is tapped by means of what is called a hammer, a small hammer. So what will happen, this is a stimulus. This is a stimulus, that is what is called, it is a reflex hammer. A reflex hammer. This reflex hammer, when tapped again, what is called the patella of the knee, it stimulates what is called the stretch receptor formed, that is normally the biceps active, that is what we have, the quadriceps femoris muscle, the quadriceps femoris muscles and also we have another one, what is called the flexor muscle, that is what is known as the biceps femoris. So for flexing the leg, we have biceps femoris muscle, for extending uh, what is called, you have quadriceps femoris muscle, extending. So once actually the kneecap is tapped, what will happen? The stretch receptor formed in the quadriceps femoralis muscle or femoris muscle. Quadriceps femoralis or quadriceps femoris muscle. And that is actually carried away. Now this is a receptor organ. The stretch receptor is a receptor organ. And now it is carried away by the sensory neuron to what is called this the grey matter of the spinal cord where we have the relay neuron or interneuron and associated neuron which convey the message from the sensory to the motor. Now the cell bodies of the motor neurons already I mentioned situated one in the grey matter. They carry the information through the motor now and reaching the muscle namely cordyceps femoris muscle which is acting as what is called that is the effect of organ. So that what will happen now the knee jerk is taking place it is moving away. This is because of uh, what is called extensor activity of the quadriceps femoris. This is one. Sometimes you can also just actually it is going down. That is what is called reflexing taking place or fluxing taking place. I made a mistake. Fluxing taking place by the effect of the flexor muscle, namely the biceps femoris. So the biceps femoris is for fluxing the legs and quadriceps femoris is for just extending the legs. While tapping, just what will happen? We have the extension of the leg. That is what is called the knee jerk or patellar reflex because of the reflex hammer when tapped against what is called the patella. He can have such a reflex activity is taking place what is called knee jerk or patellar reflex. The same one. 
So what I mentioned here, you see that one. So the same one while tapping, the same picture with a different attitude, the same one also having the same meaning and go through that one. This is because of the receptor associated with the dendrites of the sensory neuron, what I mentioned here. These are all the stretch receptors considered as a receptor organ connected with the dendrites of the sensory neuron carrying the message to the spinal cord where you have the cell body of the motor neuron which form the synapse with the interneuron. The message being conveyed to what is called the muscle. So this is the motor impulse, the direction of the impulse towards the femoris muscle, what is called the cordyceps femoris muscle which is normally just responsible for extending that extending what is called the limbs or the leg and that is called the patellar reflex. These are the two pictures, both are same without any difference. Somehow the parts have been given in a different manner, that's all. Now in addition to this, these are all the normal reflexes taking place in the body, any response which takes place involuntarily because of the stimulation of what is called the peripheral neurons or the peripheral nervous system or the receptor organs is called normal reflex activity. So it is normally controlled by the spinal cord. So in addition to that one, we also have some acquired reflexes, the one which is normally developed because of learning or training, for example, cycling, swimming, etc. Even dancing. And these are all called conditioned reflexes. So those reflexes which are developed because of learning or training processes are called acquired reflexes or conditioned reflexes. So watering of actually mouth against the foot or seeing the foot or at the sight of foot is a natural reflex taking place involved in the body. But some reflex activities are developed in the body because of learning or training processes. And such reflexes are called conditioned reflexes or acquired reflexes. So the conditioned reflexes actually in dog was first exposed by just Ivan Paolo, simply just Ivan Paolo or Ivan Retrovitan Paolo a Russian physiologist, he only demonstrated the conditioned reflex, hence he is called as father of conditioned reflex. He demonstrated the salivary reflex in dogs to show that what conditioned reflex is developed in an animal because of learning or training process. So some reflex is developed because of learning or just what is called training process that was demonstrated by the Russian physiologist Ivan Retrovich and Paolo and hence he is called father of conditioned reflex. And the best example of what we have the salivary reflex in dogs. So it is also an example for sham feeding. What is sham feeding? The word referring to when a person is seeing the foot, smelling the foot, chewing the foot, but not swallowing the foot. So sham feeding is a process in which the foot is normally seen, the foot is normally felt to smell, the foot is also chewed, but not swallowed. This type of actual feeding is called sham feeding. And that is why here also the salivary reflex in dogs is an example for sham feeding or not considered as a bell feeding. Sometimes it may be given in the question paper like that. So salivary reflex in dogs is an example for sham feeding. Here normally the salivary reflex in dog is generated by means of ringing the bell. So here what he represented, he just rang the bell along with the supply of food to the dog. So that the dog could normally just incorporate it in its mind that whenever sound of a bell was given, the food will be provided. On one stage, he refused to actually give the bell, sorry, he refused to give the food. He didn't give the food, but rang the bell. On hearing the bell, salivation occurs in the dogs. So without actually seeing the food, without smelling the food, without chewing the food, what will happen? Salivation occurs. The meaning for that one, the animal has not swallowed the foot, has not seen the foot, but it just actually incorporated in its mind, whenever bell sound was given, food will be provided. So this is a conditioned reflex, acquired reflex, a condition of training, a condition of learning process in the mind of that animal that results in salivation. So such reflexes in the case of dog, namely the salivary reflexes, an example for sham feeding. So, what do we make unconditioned reflexes? Certain reflexes are taking place in the body. For example, the migration and also for example, the breeding. So, these processes, are, these processes are genetic oriented. So, also they could be inherited. Such reflexes are called unconditioned reflexes. They are not under the control. They are not conditioned by 
they are not developed by means of learning or they are not developed by means of what is called the training process but every now and then inborn behavior as it is being normally inherited in the case of animals like breeding and migration these are all called unconditioned reflexes they are not actually developed because of learning or migration now so where all the reflex parts are developed what is the reason for that one why we have the formation of reflex part in the spinal cord not in the just along with the brain so normally the conditioned reflexes are developed in the spinal cord not mostly in the brain so reflex parts the various components of uh, what is called the reflex action the anatomical basis of reflex action are normally developed in the spinal cord itself so although the impulses actually also goes on to reach the brain the impulses are also reaching the brain though the impulses are reaching the brain normally the reflex arc is developed in the spinal cord though the impulses are reaching the spinal cord during the process of reflex activity what is the reason for that one so normally reflex arcs so normally reflex arcs have developed or have evolved in animals because the thinking process of the brain is not fast enough why are they developed in the spinal cord the reason for that one the thinking process of the brain is not fast enough so we have the reflex arcs normally have evolved in the spinal cord so reflex arcs normally actually so reflex arcs have developed or evolved in animals an efficient way of functioning so it is an efficient way of functioning just in the absence of two thought process performed by the brain so the reflex arcs are developed mainly in the spinal cord the reason for that one the brain thinking is not fast enough so the animals have evolved reflex arcs actually an efficient way of actually functioning an efficient way of functioning even in the absence of what is called two thought processes the one which is being performed by the brain so two thought processes normally formed in the brain but it is not fast enough that is why the reflex arcs have evolved only in the spinal cord to just an important way of efficient functioning of the nervous system now so far we studied about the central nervous system the brain spinal cord related to the reflex activity now the second component of the nervous system what we have the peripheral nervous system which includes all those nerves arising from the brain spinal cord and also we have the autonomous nervous system i mentioned already the afferent nerves efferent nerves which are all the component of the cranial nerves and spinal nerves along with autonomous nervous system together constitute the peripheral nervous system and this one deviates from the central nervous system carrying the impulses from the central nervous system to different parts of the body now what are the components of the peripheral nervous system one cranial nerves those nerves arising from the brain are called cranial nerves all the nerves are pair so we have normally in human being there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves out of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves four pairs of cranial nerves have originated from the brain the remaining eight pairs of cranial nerves normally originated from the medulla oblongata you could see here the first four pairs namely for example <coughs> optic nerve that is we have just actually the auditory so the first four pairs we know that one just the sensory nerves two and motor nerves two and all the four nerves originate from what is called the brain and the remaining eight pairs are originating starting from the fifth cranial nerve that is what is called trigeminal and up to the 12th what is called the spinal accessory the spinal accessory sorry the last one the hypoglossus and the 12th nerve so all these eight nerves which are found in pairs originate from the spinal sorry from what is called the medulla oblongata so all the cranial nerves are originating from the brain the first four pairs from what is called the first part they will be the brain and the remaining eight pairs from the last part of the brain the hind brain namely the medulla oblongata now in the case of an amnios for example fishes and amphibians we have 10 pairs of cranial nerves and so also in the case of reptilian form just only exclusively in snakes snake is an example for reptilian form normally in the case of reptiles we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves but in the case of snakes too we have only 10 pairs of cranial nerves as in the case of fishes and amphibians 
And in the case of amniotes, the bone which includes reptiles, birds, and mammals, excluding the snakes, we have 12 pairs of cranials. Amniotes like reptiles, birds, and mammals, they have 12 pairs of cranials, excluding the snakes, which are coming under the group reptiles. Now, so what are the 12 pairs of cranials? So we have normally just three pairs of nerves are sensory. Five pairs of nerves are normally motor, the remaining four pairs are mixed. So we have, for example, the sensory nerves. What are the three sensory nerves? Number one, the olfactory nerve. Number two, the optic nerve. And number eight, what is called the auditory nerve. So these three nerves are normally sensory in nature. These three nerves are sensory. Number one, number two, number seven. Number one, the olfactory nerve. Number two, the optic nerve. The one which goes to the olfactory epithelium of the nose. The second one goes to the retina of the eye. The third one goes to the cochlea. So there you have cochlea now and also vestibular now and both are the branches of the auditory nerve. So number one, number two, number eight. That is olfactory, optic and also auditory. These are all the sensory nerves. Then we have so five pairs of nerves or simply that is a motor nerves. Number three, number four, number six, number three, oclomotor now. Number four, trochlear or pathetic now. And number six, what is called abducens now, the smallest now. So these three nerves, oclomotor now, then trochlear now or pathetic now, or abducens, the smallest cranial now, the sixth now, all supply the six muscles of eye. The rectus muscles and oblique muscles, superior inferior rectus muscles and also inferior oblique muscles, superior oblique muscles, external rectus muscles like that. So there are six eye muscles responsible for the movement of the eyeball. These six muscles are under the control of that is oclomotor number three, then trochlear number four and number six we have abducens the smallest. So these three are motor along with there is the eleventh cranial nerve, what is called spinal accessory, and also the twelfth one hypoglossal. So spinal accessory and hypoglossal, these are also considered as the motor nerve. So three sensory nerves: number one, number two, number eight, and now five motor nerves: number three, number four, number three, number four, number six, number eleven, and number twelve. The remaining nerves are mixed nerves. For example, there is five, seven. 9 and 10. 5, 7, 9, 10 is not the mixer nerves because both sensor and motor. The fifth cranial nerve is called trigeminal because it has three branches. You see that one ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. And now it is originating from what is called the ganglion, caesarean ganglion. So I mentioned already the first four pass from the brain. Now the fifth one is arising from the middle of the as soon as it leaves from the middle of the it is connected to a ganglion, what is called caesarean ganglion. As I mentioned earlier, the sixth cranial nerve is the smallest cranial nerve, that is what is called the abducens, a motor nerve, one of the five motor nerves. I mentioned five motor nerves, three sensory and four mixer. Number five, the mixer nerve. Number seven, that is what is called the facial nerve, it is also a mixer nerve. We have palatine, corda tympani, and also higher mandibular. These are the nerves supplying branches to the palate, tongue, salivary glands, lower jaw, neck, and pinna. So that's why it's called scarlet tympani, one of the branches. Then number eight, I mentioned that is the auditory nerve, that is which includes the vestibular and cochlea. Both are sensory, supplying the branches too. Now the ninth one, just we have the fifth one, seventh one, and ninth one. These are the mixer now. The ninth cranial now is called glossopharyngeal because it's the one which is supplying branches to the tongue. So it includes lingual and pharyngeal, lingual and pharyngeal. So 7, 9 and then 10. 5, 7, 9 and 10. These are all just actually the mixer nerves. Now the 10th cranial now is the largest now and the most important now. So 6th cranial now, the abducens is the smallest cranial now, supplying its branches to the eye muscle. Now the 10th cranial now is the most important now because it supplies its branches to the lungs, the heart, the larynx and also to the stomach and also to the esophagus. So all these things are two very important structures stimulating the secretions or suppressing the secretions, stimulating the activities of heart etc. So the 10th cranial now, vagus now is the largest now. 
It includes superior laryngeal, recurrent laryngeal, depressor cardiac, and also for example, pneumocastic. So cardiac depressor, depressor cardiac, which decreases the activity of the heartbeat. So, and pneumogastric, connected to the lungs, stomach, esophagus, etc. Then I mentioned already the 11th and 12th cranial nerves are motor nerves. The 11th one is called spinal accessory nerve. And the 12th one is hypoglossal. And they are connected to the respective parts like the pharynx, almost related to the pharynx all around the neck region. And tongue and also the lower part of uh, the lower jaw, what we have the float, the higher apparatus. So it may be how in human body there are 12 cranial nerves out of which 5 are motor then three are sensory and four are mixed. So optic, olfactory, auditory are the sensory nerves. Now the spinal nerves. Those nerves arising from the spinal cord are called the spinal nerves. There are about actually 31 pairs of spinal nerves in human body. Unlike other mammals, for example, in the case of rabbit, we have just 37 pairs. In the case of frog, there is 10 pairs of spinal the first spinal nerve is the hypoglossal in the case of frog. But in the case of species of Rana tigrina, tigrina species, we have 9 pairs of cranial nerves. Now in the case of frog, 10 pairs, the species tigrina shows only 9 pairs of cranial nerves. So we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves based on the location where they are emerging out. We can have cervical 8 pairs, thoracic 12 pairs, lumbar 5 pairs. Normally they are emerging from the intervertebral foramina through this one, through this opening from the spinal cord. So cervical 8, then thoracic 12 pass, then we have lumbar 5 pass, sacral 5 pass and coccygeal spinal nerve there is one pair. So all together we have just normally just 31 pairs. They are all localized in different regions. According to the regions their name is so. And now this is the arrangement. So normally I mentioned the spinal cord shows two enlargements, cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. And now the nerves 1 to 8 arising from the neck region are called cervical nerves. Then just we have T1 to T12. This all together 12 pairs. T1 to T12. This is C1 to C8. This is T1 to T12. All together we have 12 pairs of thoracic nerves. And L1 to L5 we have lumbar, just the spinal nerves. And S1 to S5, we have sacral nerves and then coccygeal the nerve one pair. Now these spinal nerves normally form just nerve plexus. They are grouped together. Now the first five pairs of cervical nerves join together to form a cervical plexus. And one such branch from the cervical flex is called phrenic nerve, which supplies its branch to the diaphragm. So C1 to C5, they form what is called the cervical plexus, supplying their branches to different parts of the neck. And one such branch arising from that one is called the phrenic nerve, which supplies its branch to the diaphragm. And then C6, C7, C8 and T1, these four pairs of nerves together form a plexus, what is called the brachial, brachial plexus. That is C6, C7, C8 and also T1, thoracic nerve 1. And all these four pairs of nerves together form the brachial flexus near the forelimbs. They supply the branches to the forelimb. And then also we have the lumbosacral plexus, the last thoracic nerve, that is T12. And all the lumbar nerves, L1 to L5, and all the sacral nerves, all together to form what is called a sacral flexus, lumbosacral flexus. Formation of the plexus by the lumbar spinal and then sacral nerves along with the last thoracic nerve which is supply branches to the hind limb region. So these are all the different plexus is what we have cervical, brachial and also we have lumbosacral plexus. And normally each spinal nerve arises from the spinal cord by means of two root, a dorsal root and a ventral root. The dorsal root is normally sensory in nature whereas the ventral root is motor in nature. Now the sensory now enters in the spinal cord through the sensory root and the motor just actually the branch leaves the spinal cord through the motor root, sorry, through the ventral root. So the dorsal root is purely sensory and the ventral root is purely motor. So the spinal now is different from actually the cranial now. Here all the spinal nerves are mixed nerves because we have the spinal nerve is formed by the combination of a sensory nerve and a motor nerve. That is why 
it is called as a mixer now which is being insulated together normally i mentioned all the spinal nerves leave the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramina the openings present in between the successive vertebrae they are called intervertebral foramina they normally the nerves leave the spinal cord through this intervertebral foramina now in the case of frog at the place of emergence of such spinal nerves there is a calcareous gland there are calcareous glands present at the place of emergence of such spinal nerves near what is called the vertebral column on either side and these glands are called glands of swimmer dam these are all calcareous glands they are not present in the case of human being present only in the case of frog they are nothing but calcareous glands present on either side just at the place of emergence of the spinal nerve in the case of frog now what are the branches of the spinal nerve now each spinal nerve divides into three branches or rami so one is called now this is the dorsal ramus of spinal nerve this is what's called the dorsal branch and then the two the ventral ramus of spinal nerve or ventral just a branch so dorsal branch is called dorsal ramus the branches are named as rami so the dorsal ramus of spinal nerve and then we have the ventral ramus of spinal nerve the third one what is called the sympathetic ramus sympathetic ramus they are connected to the ganglionic chain of the sympathetic nervous system they are connected to the ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system the sympathetic ramus are also called as ramus communicans this is also called as ramus communicans so dorsal ramus ventral ramus and also we have what is called sympathetic ramus or visceral ramus now the dorsal ramus normally goes to the skin and the muscles of the back then the ventral ramus normally innervates the ventral lateral parts of the body and now this visceral branch or what we can say sympathetic ramus or ramus communicans it joins the sympathetic nervous system and it joins the ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system supplying the visceral organs that is why it's called a visceral so the visceral branch or ramus communicans or sympathetic ramus join with the sympathetic nervous system now with the joint to the ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system and the supply the branches to the visceral organs hence called as the visceral branch we have this is what's called sympathetic ramus or ramus communicans connecting the spinal nerve with sympathetic ganglia a chain of ganglia formed by the sympathetic nervous system it's related about this one Now I mentioned about the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, and lumbar sacral plexus. Already described about along with the diagram. So the cervical plexus is formed by one to five C one to C five nerves, and one such branch from that one is called the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm. Then the brachial plexus it is formed by you see that one six seven eight that is C six seven and eight along with what is called the first thoracic spinal nerves T one. It supplies its branches to the forelimbs, and then we have the lumbar sacral plexus. We have the last thoracic spinal nerve T12. Then all lumbar L1 to L5, and all sacral S1 to S5, and all form just actually that is a plexus which supply the branches to the hind limbs. Now a thalamus nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system includes the cranial nerves, spinal nerves. Now let's pass on to the next one. What is called the autonomous nervous system? So the autonomous nervous system is an independent nervous system. It is partly independent, but not under the voluntary control. It is partly independent, but not under the control of not under the voluntary control. And this one serves as an intermediary normally, intermediary structure through which The central nervous system controls the involuntary activities. It is an intermediary part that plays an important role in controlling the involuntary activities through the central nervous system. So now the central nervous system controls some of the involuntary activities through these uh, intermediary structures, what are called the autonomous nervous system. And now this autonomous nervous system is also called as a visceral nervous system because it innervates most of the visceral organs in the body. most of the visceral organs in the body that is why it's called as visceral nervous system and the nerves if you are just taking the autonomous nervous system the nerves all the nerves are motor and they are all in efferent in nature 
So the system handling motor, controlling only the motor information, sending out only the motor information never passes. What is called the sensory, just uh, the activities are sensory impulses to us. It always leaves from the spinal cord carrying the motor impulses and they are acting as efferent nerves. Never act as what are called efferent nerves or sensory nerves. So the entire nervous system is motor having only the efferent nerves and no sensory or what is called efferent nerves. So it is of two types. One is called a sympathetic nervous system, another one a parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is also called as what is known as thoracolumbar or flow because it has a chain of ganglia present on either side of what is called thoracic and lumbar region. It has its nerve chain. That is, it leaves mainly from the thoracolumbar region. That is why it's called as thoracolumbar outflow. The nerves are leaving from the ganglia. There are about actually 21 just actually ganglia. We can say a chain of 21 small ganglia formed on either side of uh, what is called the vertebral column that constitutes a sympathetic nervous system. To which are connected, we have the pre-synaptic or pre-actually synaptic fibers and post-synaptic fibers. Pre-sympathetic fibers and post-sympathetic fibers or we can say pre-synaptic or post-synaptic fibers. And actually, such a type of chain of ganglia absent in the case of parasympathetic nervous system. We can have only a chain of ganglia that is 21 ganglia on either side of the vertebral column only in the case of sympathetic and big absent in the case of parasympathetic nervous system. Now, I mentioned already these sympathetic ganglia are connected to the ramus communicans. The ramus communicans, that is the visceral branch, a sympathetic branch of what is called the spinal nerves. Now the parasympathetic nervous system. So they are making their origin from the cranial region and also from what is called the sacral region. Hence it is called craniosacral outflow. That one is thoracolumbar outflow. And this one, the origin of parasympathetic nervous system from the cranial region as well as from the sacral region. That is why it is called craniosacral outflow. And it consists of pre-ganglionic and post-ganglionic fibers. So we have, before the ganglion, just we have a ganglionic nerve fiber. And after the ganglion, we have what is called a ganglionic nerve fiber. Accordingly, the position pre-ganglionic and post-ganglionic nerve fibers. Now, even in the case of sympathetic nervous system also, we have pre-ganglionic and post-ganglionic nerve fibers. Here, the pre-ganglionic nerve fibers are longer. And they form a synapse with the ganglion, the one which is formed near the organ. But in the case of sympathetic nervous system, the pre-ganglionic nerve fiber is shorter, it forms a synapse with the ganglia present near the vertebral column. That is the main difference. Pre-ganglionic nerve fiber is shorter in the case of sympathetic nervous system, longer in the case of a, what is called this one parasympathetic nervous system. So the pre-ganglionic nerve fibers normally join just simply 3, 7, 9 and 10 cranial nerves. They join the pre-ganglionic just Fibers join third, that is, we see then third, seven, nine, and ten cranial nerves, and also second, third, and fourth sacral spinal nerves. That is why they call us what we have the cranial sacral outflow. So these nerve fibers, namely the pre-ganglionic nerve fibers, are connected to the third, seventh, ninth, and tenth cranial nerves, and also the second, third, and fourth what is called the sacral spinal nerves, hence the name is called cranial sacral outflow. They are connected to such as spinal nerves and also cranial nerves of the brain. Normally both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves innervate the same organs, but their function is antagonistic. They are working in an opposite way. The sympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerves are innervating the same organs, for example the eye. One dilates the people of the eye, another one constricts the people of the eye. One increases the stimulation of secretion of gastric juice, another one suppresses the secretion of gastric juice, like that. So, both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, parasympathetic nerves are innervating the same organs, but their effect is antagonistic, that is, working in an opposite manner. That is why there is a nickname for them together, the autonomous nervous system. It is together called as the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, together called as accelerated and breakdown of the body, accelerated and break down the system of the body. So one system accelerates, another one just suppresses, hence called accelerated breakdown system of the body, the total autonomous nervous system because of the 
antagonistic effect of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So we have accelerating, just actually accelerator and breakdown system of the body. Here is the tubular column showing a comparison between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. I mentioned already, if you are taking about the sympathetic nervous system, it is actually referred as that is what is called thoracolumbar outflow and here it is referred as cranio that is what is called sacral outflow. As I mentioned normally the pregabalinic nerve fibers originate only from the spinal cord but here the pregabalinic nerve fibers originate both from the brain and spinal cord that is why it is called as cranio sacral outflow. I mentioned already just we got third, seven, nine and ten cranial nerves and also just actually we have second, third and fourth sacral spinal nerves. That is why the origin is both from the brain and the spinal cord. Here the origin is only from the spinal cord. And I mentioned the pre-gamelic nerve fibers are very shorter in the case of sympathetic nervous system. There also we have pre ganglionic nerve fiber but it is more elongated and forming a synapse with the ganglia near the organ. That is why the pre ganglionic nerve fibers are longer. Then I mentioned just on either side of the vertebral column we have a chain of ganglia in the case of sympathetic nervous system that one is being absent in parasympathetic. So what about the nature of the release of the neurotransmitter? Now in the case of sympathetic nervous system the nerve ending releases what is called sympathy or noradrenaline. That is why they are considered as adrenergic similar to that of what is called that is we have the myelinated nerve. It is similar to that of myelinating nerve fiber, sympathetic nerve system, because there also the neurotransmitter is nothing but acetylcholine. So the pre ganglionic nerve fiber, sorry, I mean, so it is similar to that of what is called just simply that is myelinated, um, non myelinated nerve fiber. There only you have the adrenaline or norepinephrine. So the sympathetic nerve system is similar to that of what is called just non myelinated nerve fiber where also the release of neurotransmitter is adrenaline or epinephrine or not adrenaline. So pre ganglic nerve fibers are adrenergic, the meaning for that one they release the neurotransmitter not adrenaline or sympathy. But here in the case of pre ganglionic fibers they are cholinergic because they release acetylcholine as in the case of myelinated nerve fibers. This is similar to the myelinated nerve fibers. Because the neurotransmitter release at the nerve ending is nothing but acetylcholine. Now, they have mostly excitatory effect. For example, dilation of the pupil. Dilation of the pupil. And this one normally just a consection of people. They have mostly inhibitory effect. But in the case of salivary glands or in the case of alimentary canal secretions or in the case of, for example, the peristalsis movement, this one shows inhibitory effect, that one shows actually acceleratory effect. Only in three activities it shows acceleratory effect, that is peristalsis and also secretion of saliva, secretion of gastric juice, all be increased or accelerated by this system where all these being inhibited. But this one is responsible for increasing the ventilation rate, increasing the heartbeat rate, increasing for example just to you have the um, ventilation rate and the blood pressure all being increased by this one but the three functions relate to the secretions of digestive juice, salivary secretion and also peristalsis it has it has an inhibitory effect we'll see here now here is the, actually the comparison between the functions so one, two, three, four. You see that one. In all cases, the sympathetic nervous system has an accelerated effect. Dilates people, bronchi and bronchioles, increases the heartbeat rate, increases ventilation rate. That is a pulmonary ventilation, increases the blood pressure. In all these four cases, normally the parasympathetic nervous system has inhibitory effect. It constricts people, bronchi, bronchioles, decreases the heartbeat rate, decreases the ventilation rate, decreases the blood pressure. But the last three. It is having an accelerated effect, what I mentioned earlier. It stimulates the secretion of saliva. It stimulates what is called peristalsis. It stimulates the secretion of alimentary canal. Whereas here the sympathetic nervous stimulation inhibits salivation, inhibits the alimentary canal secretions and also inhibits peristalsis. So the first four, we have accelerated effect. The next three, inhibitory effect in sympathetic nervous system. There in parasympathetic system, the first of four, we have inhibitory effect. 
the last three accelerating effect. Now ventricles of the brain. See, there are certain the brain is somewhat a hollow structure, and such hollow structure encloses certain cavities. The cavities of the brain, which are filled with the fluid, what is called cerebrospinal fluid, is called as ventricle. The cavities of the brain are called ventricles. These are filled with CS. There are four ventricles in the human brain. The ventricles 1 and 2 are present in the right and left cerebral hemispheres respectively. They are called as lateral ventricles, also called as paracel. Now, these two ventricles separately open into the ventricle number 3 formed in the diencephalon by means of an opening what is called foramen of man row. Ventricles 1 and 2, paraventricles, are also called as just as simply we can have prosil. They are also called as prosil or paracel. Prosil or paracel. Para means lateral, pro means first. So they are called as actually together the paracel and then open separately into the third ventricle formed in the diencephalon by means of an aperture called foramen of man. Third ventricle is formed actually, the third ventricle is formed actually in the diencephalon region. This is called dice. Now this third ventricle just opens into the fourth ventricle by means of a duct, a narrow canal. This is called aqueductus, aqueduct of sylvius or cerebral aqueduct. So there is a, a duct, a passage connecting the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle, the one which is found in the middle of oblongata by means of cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of sylvius. Now the roof of the fourth ventricle has three openings. Two of them are called the lateral openings, the one is median. The two lateral openings are called foramen of Lashka. Foramen of Lashka. And the median aperture, just actually the, the pair of lateral apertures, the openings, the lateral apertures are called foramen of Lashka. And the median aperture, that is called foramen of Mandendi. And through these openings are the holes. Normally, the CSF is moving upward and enter into the subarachnoid space. So, these are openings formed in the fourth ventricle and for allowing the passage of CSF to reach the subarachnoid space. Now, cerebrospinal fluid. So, it is just a, a plasma, a clear fluid, normally occupying or just filling the cavities of the bright as well as the central canal of spinal cord. So, the ventricles of the brain and the spinal cord is filled with a clear fluid and that fluid is more or less similar to the plasma. So, also we have some differences between plasma and CSF and we can see later about that one, a few differences. And it is produced specifically by one group of cells, what is called ependymal cells. Now, these ependymal cells are present in the roof of the ventricles. The ependymal cells along with the supporting tissues of them and also the blood capillaries together form a complex structure what is called choroid plexus. We have anterior choroid plexus and posterior choroid plexus. They are actually secreting the plasma into the cerebral cavities and that forms what is known as cerebrospinal fluid. So the CSF is secreted by the CSF is secreted by epidermal cells. So here is a comparison, a few differences between plasma and CSF. If you are taking the proteins, amino acids, cholesterol, the concentration of these three normally more in plasma but less in CSF. And if you are taking normal these two, that is what is called magnesium and chloride, and these two are less in plasma and more. So one question related to which one of the following element is highly concentrated in CSF, that is magnesium as well as chloride. So, and if you are comparing the glucose, the glucose concentration is same both in just CSF in plasma or sometimes it is less than plasma in the case of CSF. And if you are taking sodium bicarbonate, it is same in both plasma and CSF. These are all some of the differences or comparison between plasma and CSF. But the element which is highly concentrated in the CSF is magnesium and chloride. Now, what is the volume of actually CSF in human? It is about 150 ml. What is the rate of formation? It is about 550 ml per day. And what is the role of this CSF? It is acting as a mechanical buffer being found inside and outside the central nervous system, keeping the pressure normally inside the cavities of the ventricles or inside the cavities of the brain. 
and also acting as a shock absorber protecting the brain from external injuries while the head is moving there so that is about the CSR and we have to know something some of the facts related to that is what is called just the nervous system what do you mean by cybernetics so it is a field of study because I would like to say something about that one it is a field of study dealing with chemical and nervous coordination so cybernetics normally deals with the neural and chemical coordination of the body so these are the facts this is over up to CSR and some of the facts relate to the coordinating system the study dealing with the nervous and then chemical coordination is called cybernetics now some more facts related to what are the diseases related to the nervous system one is stroke it is also called cerebrovascular disease a clot in the cerebral vessel is called a cerebral thrombosis that is in the brain vessel is called cerebral thrombosis or stroke that's why it's called cerebrovascular disease brain hemorrhage this is nothing but the bleeding of the blood vessels in the brain because of two factors one is high blood pressure or hypertension another one aneurysm so aneurysm means now suppose you have the blood vessel in some regions the part of the blood vessel become the part of the blood vessel becomes weak so that it is bulging out and then later ruptures this condition is called aneurysm bulging of or ballooning of the arterial blood vessels because of high blood pressure because of the weakness that is called aneurysm and followed by the rupture leading to the leakage then meningitis so we have the membranes the meninges the inflammation of the meninges the bright membranes and also the subarachnoid space is called what is known as meningitis now alzheimer's disease it is also called as chronic just brain syndrome chronic brain syndrome so this is actually nothing but progressive loss of memory memory loss due to old age while aging so progressive loss of memory followed by general loss of cognitive function so the perceptive function general loss of perception that is called cognitive functions and leading to the death so while undergoing age where the person is attaining more and more age this is a condition of chronic brain syndrome that is what we call the progressive loss of memory followed by the loss of general loss of cognitive function the perceptive power has been lost leading to the death this disorder, is, this, this disorder is normally most prevalent in the case of old aged people above the age of 80 and people with less age below 50 are not affected by this disease. What is the reason for that one? It is due to the atrophy of cerebral cortex, atrophy of cerebral cortex, diminution in function, diminution in function, shrinkage of the part. So atrophy means normally decrease in size. Here the atrophy of the cerebral cortex which is normally resulted because of the degeneration of the neurons with the accumulation of what is called one type of protein amyloid protein plate a covering is formed above the cerebral cortex from the degenerated neurons and also a protein amyloid leading to the plaque formation covering ultimately results in what we have Alzheimer's disease and it is attributed that people with the Down syndrome is mostly affected because of the presence of a gene in the 21st chromosome. So people with the Down syndrome are affected by chronic brain syndrome. Now hydrocephaly. This is nothing but the accumulation of more CSF within the brain. It is normally a recessive gene disorder. A recessive gene disorder, particularly this is X-linked gene disorder. Accumulation of more cerebrospinal fluid. So we have an increased quantity of cerebrospinal fluid within the cavities of the brain then multiple sclerosis it is one of the autoimmune diseases here the sclerosis the hardening of the myelin sheath of the neurons occur or the loss of myelin sheath occurs. either hardening of the myelin sheath or the loss of the myelin sheath leading to the loss of conduction of electrical impulses by the nerve fiber it is an example for autoimmune disease because it is developed against unknown antigen and antibodies then epilepsy see we have there are four waves in the brain alpha beta delta and theta these are the four waves in the brain electric waves these waves should be normal then only the person should be normal if there is any deviation from such four waves then we have epilepsy the fix the what is called 
convulsion of the muscles that occurs and that is called epilepsy. It happens when the electrical waves of the brain are not normal. There are four waves, alpha, beta, delta, theta and these four waves should be normal for the normal functioning of the brain. If these waves are abnormal then the persons have developed the muscular convulsions and that is called epilepsy. Now borderline personality disorder simply called as BPD. Some cases you know that one some persons are having what is called unpredictable mood. Unpredictable mood. Outburst of emotions. Always, always conflicts with others. They have developed the disorder what is called borderline personality disorder. So, outburst, that is we have outburst of emotions. Unpredictable mood, we cannot judge what type of mood that person has. So, that is called unpredictable moods. Outburst of emotions some always conflicts with others, not adjusting with others. This type of disorder, a brain disorder, is called borderline personality disorder. And another disorder related to the brain is schizophrenia. This is what is called split personality disorder. Split personality disorder. The person is behaving differently at two different times. This is called schizophrenia. The encephalitis, this is an inflammation of the brain. When the brain has been inflamed, then we have the condition encephalitis because another name for brain is encephalon. Then Parkinson's disease. This is the most common disease. You know that one of the famous, uh, that is boxer, has developed this disease, Muhammad Ali. And what is the reason for that one? This is because of the degeneration of the neurons in the brain with a neurotransmitter dopamine, one of the neurotransmitters which is responsible for just controlling the movement of the body. So, which is involved normally that is dopamine in movement control. When the neurons are destroyed with this what is called neurotransmitted dopamine, the one which control the movement, then the persons have what is called the shivering of the arms, unable to keep the arms or the just with the body shaking of the head, shaking or the shivering of what is called the entire body and under digits agony. And that condition is called the Parkinson's disease after the name of the person. A famous boxer has developed this disease, Muhammad Ali, that is the world champion. So this is because of the degeneration of the brain neurons along with the neurotransmitter namely dopamine, the one which is involved, that is in movement control. So these are all some of the things related to the nervous system and if you have any doubt, go through that one, that topic what I mentioned. And with this I conclude the nervous system, let's proceed. The other part, the next one, sensory, perception and processing.